Hello everybody, welcome to the channel, Out of Ammo, Out of Time. I'm Krabby Terror 8 and today I want to talk to you about why I think Arkham Horror the Card Game has missed an entire and important class of investigators completely. Now, I'm being deliberately provocative here, so first up I want to be clear that I'm very happy with the five classes as they stand. They're strongly differentiated with clear strengths and weaknesses in such a way that choosing a class will deliver on a set of expectations around the gameplay experience. No question, the class system in Arkham Horror the card game is a triumph, which in my opinion elevates it above other Arkham Horror Files games, which don't use this system. So it is because of my love of the game that I think the class system deserves better examination and criticism because it's so good. So please don't take this video as a hatchet job, quite the opposite. So in this video, I plan to explore this issue in great detail so that by the end, I hope I've convinced you that a sixth class is something that FFG should consider for the game. So what are we going to explore? Well, First, we will look at why a class system is an important design choice in the first place. Then, we'll examine a framework for thinking about class using Jungian archetype analyses. Finally, I'll explore a new class of investigator which I think is missing in the game, and how that might work. Now to be clear, I'm not about creating fan content here, that's not something I'm good at, but I am very interested to hear your views and also please share any content which might align with what I'm talking about here today, I'd be very interested to see that. I also want to give a shout out to Nate, Lost in Time and Space and Winging It, who gave me very valuable feedback on this. They're awesome content creators and I've left links to their sites in the notes. Finally, a spoiler warning. If you are brand new to Arkham Horror the Card Game, this video assumes that you have knowledge of the game and the core campaign, The Night of the Zealot. So let's dive in, shall we? Why do we have a class system in the first place? The origins of the class system used in Arkham Horror the Card Game date back to the early days of role-playing games. Dungeons and Dragons was of course a pioneer of this system, which took inspiration from high fantasy epics such as Lord of the Rings. According to Wikipedia, the original D&D had only three main classes. They were the Cleric, the Fighting Man, and the Magic User. Later editions added the Thief as a fourth main class. Here we have a template for the class system, which has been copied and imitated to the point of being part of the DNA of the role-playing game genre. Now, the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, by contrast, has always been more flexible in its approach, with occupation oriented around a cluster of skills rather than classes. So for example, antiquarian, artist, and professor, leading to an almost infinite number of possibilities. This approach is what has been adopted across most Arkham Horror Files games to date, where investigators are defined by occupation and a cluster of unique abilities rather than a class system. So why does Arkham Horror the card game uniquely use a class system? What benefits are there from using such a system? And what are the limitations? So having played the other Arkham Horror Files games, there are a lot of things I appreciate about the class system. The class system has two core benefits for the game around one, the management of design and complexity, and two, the enhanced gameplay experience. Arkham Horror the Card Game is the most complex Arkham Horror Files game to date. As I mentioned in my gathering video, this game is a hybrid between the relative simplicity of choose your own adventure style narrative games and physical role playing games. The complexity of Arkham Horror the Card Game also grows each year as more investigators and more cards and more scenarios are added. This complexity is managed in two main ways. Firstly, the non-player cards in the game are organised into a system of scenarios and clusters of scenarios are organised into campaigns. Card sets which constitute these scenarios are coded with a symbol and instructions are given as to how to organise these cards within a given scenario. This is relatively straightforward and in many ways shares similarities with other Arkham Horror Files games and similar card games. In Eldritch Horror, for example, the Elder God, which the investigators are fighting, is represented by a series of unique card sets which are set up at the start of the game. Player cards in Arkham Horror the card game are a different matter. These cards are organised by class, 
and neutral cards, and then further delineated by three subcategories, assets, events, and skills. This is completely different to other Arkham Horror Files games because the complexity of player cards is an order of magnitude higher and demands that the card pool is given some structure. In Arkham Horror the Card Game, players are required to build decks of about 30 cards from the existing card pool, and without the class system this task would become incredibly unwieldy and lack focus. Eldritch Horror for example has a lot of player cards, tons of them in fact, but the difference is that at the start of the game each investigator starts with one or two of these cards in total, and the rest are acquired throughout the game. So in a way, it doesn't matter if Eldritch Horror has 100 or 10 million player cards, because there's no requirement to build a deck from these cards at the start. Magic the Gathering also works this way by organising cards into sets and expansions, each with a unique symbol. Rules then exist about which sets and expansions can be used to play certain formats. So we see that one of the key benefits of using the class system is to manage the complexity of the game by organising and systematising the player's cards to ensure that deck building is more manageable. Without deck building it could be argued that there's less need for a class system. The second and probably more important aspect of the class system is that it enriches and improves the gameplay experience as expressed by the piloting of investigators through a given scenario by the players. The class system is essentially a system of empowerment management. Investigators with 7 in all stats and access to an entire card pool would of course be OP, so the class system sets up limitations around how an investigator is likely to manage challenges within the scenario. For example, if I decide to choose Min from the Seeker class, then I have expectations that discovering clues will be a core strength and that I also expect the fighting will not be a core strength, because I know from experience that Seekers are not generally fighters and have low strength, but high intellect. I also know from experience that I will have access to cards, which will likely increase my effectiveness at clue gathering, will often reward card drawing, and likely help me improve movement efficiency. These expectations are important in delivering a gameplay experience which is tailored to the individual and for the group. Individuals want to experience the game from a particular perspective, and in designing a group it's usual that investigators are chosen to complement each other to maximise success and efficiency of play. Also, different players enjoy different playstyles. For lots of reasons, I don't enjoy combat in this game, in part, because I find the more pulpy aspects of Lovecraftian horror less interesting than the more cerebral aspects of the game. In all these aspects, the class system is a great way to ensure that my play experience is maximised despite the complexity of the game itself. By way of contrast, in Eldritch Horror, there are also plenty of investigators, indeed the same investigators that we find in Arkham Horror the card game. But in Eldritch Horror there is no class system, and that game does not have deck building, so you get cards with items, spells and artefacts, but there are rarely any restrictions on who can take those cards. This means that it's often very hard to see which of the 50 plus investigators in Eldritch Horror you might want to try. There is little in the way of structure to help you organise your choices. Playing Min and Roland in Ar Arkham Horror the card game feels worlds apart. Playing them in Eldritch Horror is less defined. It's harder to imagine the gameplay experience being that different in Eldritch Horror, and therefore the experience is less predictable based on the investigator alone. That's all great, but what's the downside of the class system? Well, the main downside is lack of flexibility, as investigators are funneled and restricted around the abilities and cards they can use. Call of Cthulhu prides itself on allowing players to construct whatever kind of investigators you like. And this is where the class system in Arkham Horror the Card Game shows its greatest weakness. It limits creativity and also tends to narrow the path onto which investigators can play the game. So I think there's no question that the class system is excellent and despite some downsides is a fantastic design addition to the game, which ensures that complexity is managed and the gameplay experience is optimised. But is it perfect? Well, no, of course not. One of the things I've noticed is that there is some discussion around new classes of investigators, and also I find that some investigators, I think, don't fit nicely into their class. Carolyn Fern immediately springs to mind, but also people like Preston, who are part of the rogue class, but inexplicably 
cannot use illicit cards. I have come to believe that there is a specific gap in the class system which I believe would make Arkham Horror the card game a richer, more rewarding experience and also a more complete experience. So what is this gap I'm talking about? Well, let's have a look, shall we, by using an archetype framework to explore the class system in Arkham Horror the card game. Now those of you who've watched my in-depth analysis of Roland Banks will know that I've used the Jungian archetype framework before to explain the tension between Roland's desire to be a ruler caregiver archetype only to find himself as an outlaw. I don't plan to discuss the origins of this framework and how it's used. There are plenty of books on the subject that you could read. Importantly, it is a useful tool for the analysis of popular culture. Not because there's something objectively true about it, but it is a useful way to think about things like Arkham Horror the Card Game in terms of investigators, narrative, and class. The archetypes themselves are not meant to be taken literally, but rather they are in symbolic representations of fundamental human characteristics and personalities who occur again and again in stories, movies, and video games. A fun way to use this framework is to think about the Avengers, for example, and then think about how those different Avengers might map against this framework. I haven't done it myself, but I imagine that the different superheroes would map all over this framework. Otherwise, it would make for very boring stories. Anyway, what I decided to do one day, for a bit of fun, was to have a go at mapping the classes in Arkham Horror the Card Game into the framework based upon the investigators who currently populate these classes. This is what I found. Guardians, as defined by FFG, are that they feel compelled to defend humanity and thus go out of their way to combat the forces of the mythos. They have a strong sense of duty and selflessness that drives them to protect others and hunt monsters down. So here are aspects of support and care coupled with a heroic drive to make the world right again. This to me means that this class very much aligns with the caregiver and hero archetypes. Rogues are defined by FFG as they are self-serving and out for themselves. While and opportunistic, they are always eager for a way to exploit their current situation. In my mind, this group were really easy to classify as a hybrid between outlaw, of course, but also jester. There's something subversive about rogues and the outlaw jester hybrid fits this class perfectly. Seekers are defined by FFG as they are primarily concerned with learning more about the world and about the mythos. They wish to research forgotten lore, map out uncharted areas and study strange creatures. Now this to me is clear, a hybrid between sage and explorer defines this class. Survivors might seem on the surface to fit everywhere, but I don't think so because FFG defines them as are everyday people in the wrong place at the wrong time, simply trying to survive. Ill-prepared and ill-equipped, survivors are the underdogs who rise to the occasion when their lives are threatened. There it is. They clearly sit in the everyman category, but equally, many of the survivors are wide-eyed and unaware of what's going on. So the everyman innocent hybrid makes most sense here. Finally, we have mystics who are defined as they are drawn and influenced by the arcane forces of the mythos. Many have spellcasting abilities, able to manipulate the forces of the universe through magic talent. This one is a little more vague and requires a bit more interpretation. The magician is a no-brainer, of course, but in my mind, the other aspect of mystics is their use of willpower to harness and control the forces of nature. And as such, they are to me a magician-ruler hybrid. So there we are. Every class has been classified between two archetypes fairly easily, but we can immediately see that that leaves two archetypes, the lover and the artist. What kind of class might this be? Such a class would combine the ability to connect and deeply understand people with the ability to create new and innovative ways to mesmerize, entertain, and enthrall others through art, entertainment, body language, and performance. A class I would call influencers. Now, believe it or not, there is already precedent for the influencer class in the Arkham Files games. 
and I think such a class would not only enrich the game and bring new styles and dynamics of gameplay along with them, it would also work to help find new homes for investigators who are out of place in their current class, and in addition make the parley skill more relevant and better defined within the game. So let's explore this new class, shall we? In part three, bringing the influencer class to Arkham Horror, the card game. Now, first of all, we can use other Arkham Horror Files games and Call of Cthulhu, the role-playing game, as a starting point for thinking about how the new influencer class might work. If we first look at Call of Cthulhu, we can see that there are a cluster of skills which might fit under such a class. Charm, Disguise, Fast Talk, Persuade, Psychology, and psychoanalysis. These are all fine as a cluster of abilities, but it doesn't really lead to a macro understanding of the class. It merely points the way. Now, if we look at something closer to home, both Eldritch Horror and Arkham Horror the board game both have an influence skill, which is denoted by a handshake. This skill tends to be associated with the ability to influence others to gain resources or assets, or pass some kind of story test. What is more interesting is that there are a core group of investigators who exceed at this skill of influence. One example is Charlie Kane from Eldritch Horror. Charlie's a politician in a big cigar Churchillian type of way. His stat line has an influence of four while his strength, lore and will all languish at two. His special abilities are powerful, namely he could bestow an additional action onto another investigator in a sort of a Leo De Luca type of effect, and he can also distribute assets he acquires using his high influence stat. In other words, influence here is used to deliver additional actions and assets to the team. Another example of a high influence investigator, in fact the highest influence investigator in Eldritch Horror, is Preston Fairmont. With an influence stat of five, here Preston can also acquire more assets and gain sanity from such actions. So here in Eldritch Horror, influence is seen as the influence that derives from power. The benefit of such influence is the gaining of assets and also the ability to gain extra actions for oneself or others. Well, I think there are some interesting aspects of influence from this. I would say that it's too narrow a focus from a class perspective. A new class would require a wider set of skills and benefits. Now getting even closer to home, we can see that in Arkham Horror the card game, Charlie Kane features on a prominent card, which tells us something more about how influence might work. Charisma is a card which features Charlie himself pressing the flesh with the text. When you turn on the charm, you could light the entire town. This card of course gives you extra ally slots. So we have an influence skill, which appears to be associated with the ability to confer additional benefits to others and to influence others to ally with you. That all sounds very positive, but how could it work from a darker perspective? Well, the use of influence, charisma and charm can of course be used to make others do negative things as well, to behave in ways which are counter to their nature can also be used to coerce and cajole others to give up information and materials they would otherwise be unwilling to part with. So how might this class work in practice? First of all, we must recognize that the design of the game is somewhat unbalanced when it comes to investigator actions. When it comes to the most used core actions in the game, there are essentially three, fight, evade, and investigate. Now these make up the heart of the gameplay. Now, uh, thinking about them, we might place them across two axes. One axis we might call the physical ability axis, which features fight and evade. The other axis we might call the cerebral ability axis and has investigating and exploring on it. But investigating and exploring doesn't have an adequate counterpoint on this axis. In other words, those investigators who are not strong in fighting and evading are left really only with intellect. Now you could say willpower is there of course, but willpower operates very differently to the other stats in that it is used as the essentially the currency of magic and is used to resist the mythos during the encounter phase in particular. 
So what is missing is a charm action, which is not about intellect, but the ability to use emotional intelligence and human psychology and creativity to influence others. This for me is the strongest reason why say a subclass of investigators is less than ideal. A sort of influencer subclass. By using the idea of a subclass, it's not only more complicated, but also means that charm and influence are relegated to a secondary position in this framework. When they're a fundamental aspect of human identity, and it's essential that ensuring the game is more balanced between physical and cerebral skills. So, we have a charm action, and I'm using charm here in the broadest sense. Everything from being charming and funny, through to the ability to sing or dance or perform, through to the capacity to provide psychological support, the charm action would need to activate some sort of skill test, and this would require a new skill to be added to the game. Charisma, I think, is the way to talk about this skill, and we would denote it with a handshake. This charisma skill would be strong, but not exclusive, of course, to the new class, what I'm calling the influencer class. So here we are, a class which uses charisma and charm to impact the gameplay, and also the game story with the ability to influence others in some form or shape. So how might this work? Now I have to say this is where things get tricky, because changing the core game dynamics and mechanics is fraught with problems and would require extensive playtesting. So these ideas I have are not fully formed, of course, and they haven't been tested, but they're a fun thought experiment, nevertheless. Now, the first blanket change I would propose would be to convert all of the Pali skill tests in the game to apply to this new charisma stat. So instead of intellect or willpower or another skill being used for Pali, they would use charisma instead. I never really understood why Pali, which is a form of influence, was aligned with intellect and therefore aligned strongly with seekers. Unless you believe that influencing people is a direct result of intellectual conversation, it just doesn't make sense. Intellect should not be the yardstick as to whether you succeed at a Pali or not. This immediately has the effect that those in the influencer class would generally be better at Paliing than others due to their charisma. Now this in my mind is the simplest and most straightforward change. Secondly, the game would move towards a new action. At the moment in the game, investigators can essentially fight, evade and investigate at the core. These map onto the classes of Guardian, Rogue and Seeker most directly, but not exclusively, but you know what I mean. Mages of course do these things with spells, and survivors tend to do these things through sheer luck and pluck by design. This means that the charisma skill will need to map onto a new action which provides a benefit to the investigators. This is the charm action we discussed before. So what would the charm action actually do? It would need to do something that attempted to improve the game state for the players, but doesn't do the same things as fight, evade and investigate. So how might this new stat work and what benefit could be derived from it? The stat itself must impact enemies because charisma isn't going to do work on, say, a table or a chair or a bowl or something. I would also say that charm and charisma would only work on humanoid enemies. I cannot imagine that a Biaki would be paying much attention to charm in general, although gifted musicians may be able to influence monsters in some manner. Finally, what is the stat testing against? Well, without adding a new stat to enemies, the health stat is probably the best to choose. This would mean that as enemies become weaker, they become more susceptible to charm. So one strategy might be to damage the enemy and then seek to charm them to avoid any further impact. If we assume that charisma generally works on humanoid enemies, then a successful skill test could potentially do one of the following. One. A successful charm means an enemy is moved to a connecting location. This is the idea that the influencer can persuade the enemy that they're better off somewhere else entirely, so that they would disengage and then they would move. A successful charm means the enemy becomes an ally. They would move alongside the ally slot and can tank damage and perhaps even fight for you in some way. 
I like the idea of cultists fighting for an influencer against other cultists, for example, as the investigator has managed to turn them. The amount of time they remain an ally could be based on how successful the skill test is. So if you're two up, then they stay with you for two turns, that kind of thing. A doom or clue can be added or removed from enemies. Not sure about this one as the doom is more mythos driven and it feels a bit more situational. Another variant on this could be that either the doom transforms to a clue or that a clue is created on the location. This is a game dynamic which is not new of course. This would mimic the idea of charming the enemy into giving up information that would otherwise stay hidden. Now of course individual investigators would and could have additional benefits around these ideas. One of the things that is attractive about this approach is that it gives a home to a series of investigators as follows. Number one, Lola. Lola is currently neutral, but is a born performer, and I think would fit perfectly in this class with a high charm stat. Carolyn Fern. Carolyn Fern doesn't fit in Guardian at all. She can barely fight and her skills around psychology are important, but I feel a little undercooked. Giving her a charisma stat of four or five would transform her into a more compelling investigator. Safina. Why Safina even in the rogue class? She's an artist, not a con artist, and a very gifted artist at that. A mystic influencer would be a better fit for her. Preston Fairmont. He's an influencer through and through, but why is he a rogue? He can't even take illicit cards. No, an influencer survivor kind of hybrid to me makes more sense. And finally, Charlie Kane. We've talked about Charlie already. He isn't in Arkham Horror, the card game, but I imagine he might appear in the future. He isn't an investigator, true, but without this class, I'm not sure where he would go. He's a high-powered politician and not much else. I would say he is pure influencer through and through. So there you have it. A new class, a new skill, all of which balances the class system out in a way that feels richer and more varied. This class, the influence class, means an opportunity for new play styles and gives a home to those investigators who don't easily sit in the current class system. So what do you think? I'm very interested to see and hear your thoughts on this one. So thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate everyone who comments and subscribes. Once again, a big thank you to Nate from Lost in Time and Space and winging it. I would also very much like to thank Laser Rocks, uh, the board game creators and uh, counter creators for allowing me to use the images of the classes. They're awesome. Uh, and a link to their website uh, will be in the notes. Also a very big thank you to Klimo S who's comments on my uh, video about what to analyze next was an inspiration um, for this video. Thank you, Clemo or Clemo. Uh, I'm really glad that you posted that. So until next time, I'm Krabby Terror 8. Thank you so much and I'll see you soon. Thank you.